Hey everyone, how's it going? Happy Thursday, and sorry, it's Wednesday. And good morning, it's been that kind of a week, everyone. Uh, my name is Arvind, I head up product for Wicker, and we launched an amazing native service uh, on Monday, and I also have Nick with me from Uncommon. Nick, why don't you introduce yourself? Yeah, I'm Nick Powers, the COO of Uncommon LLC out of St. Louis, Missouri. So I'm happy to be here, excited. Reinvent 2022, it's been a great week so far, so we're really looking forward to telling you a little bit more about Wicker and, uh, and our work. Yeah, Nick's been an amazing partner. Some of the stories that Nick is gonna tell today is definitely gonna blow your mind in terms of the work that they are doing. So to get started, I wanted to touch base on how we always work backwards from our customers' needs. So when we, when AWS acquired Wicker back in June 21, uh, we went ahead and worked with our customers to understand what kind of a need they have for a communication service like Wicker. And the answer was, like, there are a lot of collaboration tools out there. Uh, obviously, the security postures differ based on which communication tool you use. Uh, customers expressed a need for a tool with advanced security. Um, for very mission critical situations and to transfer sensitive data from one place to another place. Customers also expressed that they want flexible controls to manage their organizations, to control how users come in and go out of the network, to control who they can collaborate with externally in terms of partners and vendors, which gives them more control over how their data is being transferred, secured, and communicated. And th this is important because in many scenarios, our customers, because of the need of advanced security, uh, which is end-to-end -end encryption, they ended up using consumer-grade products. And that put them in hot waters because consumer-grade products are great for getting started. However, they, don't, they do not give you control over who has access to the data. They do not give you control over who your employees kind of chat with because you know, they can chat with anyone and share data with anyone and you have no control over it. So a lot of uh, regulatory bodies started talking to our customers and you know, they were in some hot waters with respect to the regulations that they couldn't meet. Which brings us to the next point where they expressed that security is great, controls is great, but I want a tool that will help me meet all of the auditory and re regulatory requirements that I have. This includes um, if you are from the financial industry, SEC 17A4, if you are in the public sector, FOIA requests, and e-discovery litigation code, and all that stuff. Uh, the customers explicitly said they want the ability to retain data selectively so that they can produce the data for auditing and regulatory needs. All of this is great, but we need a fully functional product, which is extremely easy to use. Uh, at the heart of it, no matter how we think about it, it's a messaging product, it's a chat product. So you need, um, in terms of capabilities, an extremely easy way to you know, chat with people, um, a, a very simple experience to kind of share stuff, um, start audio video calls. So we focused a lot on improving our user experience so that you know, um, security doesn't compromise the ability for people to actually talk to each other. So we um, launched Wicker on AWS Wicker on Monday, um, and you know Wicker is an enterprise service that actually meets all of the needs that I kind of just spoke about. So it's an enterprise service with a suite of collaboration features, and this includes messaging, audio, video calling, uh, file transfer, um, you know, ability to talk to external people. Like it's basically a very fully functional messaging app. Um, Everything that we do in Wicker is end-to-end -end encrypted. Um, it's multi-device, mobile desktop. In fact, more than 80% of our usage is actually from the mobile devices. So we are a mobile-first product, and we have a pretty good desktop experience, but our mobile experience is really, really good. And yeah, we do offer flexible and granular controls to manage your organization. And again, um, in order to meet the data retention requirements for our customers, we have built a unique uh, customer-controlled data retention model. I will touch more upon this in the coming slides, um, but it's probably one of the very innovative things that we did in the last one year in order to differentiate ourselves in the market with respect to a very secure way to you know, provide data retention. 
And we also have flexible deployment models. We understand that uh, customers would prefer a SaaS product where you know, um, AWS manages and hosts all of the infrastructure and gets customers scale. But we also understand some customers would want more control over their deployment. So we also provide a self-hosted version where customers can completely control their infrastructure, not just from a data standpoint, but also from a messaging, routing, and calling standpoint as well. So let's take a look at how it works. Um, obviously, uh, it all starts with organizations creating a network, what we call a network. And once they create a network and add users into it, users can message one-on-one, -on -one, rooms, group chat, uh, they can call, um, there's screen sharing, file sharing, and you know, uh, there is federation with other companies, partners. We do understand that it's important for cross-organizational collaboration as well. And uh, everything is extensible in the sense that you can automate workflows, and everything you automate within Wicker is also encrypted. And you can extend all of this through the workflows, and you can actually extend all the communication that happens within Wicker to a configurable data store to retain data as well. So let's talk about encryption. Um, when we say everything is end-to-end -end encrypted, um, I want to take a step back and explain uh, what that means. Um, in a traditional encryption world, um, you've got client-to-server encryption, which is you know, TLS and, and all that stuff. However, end-to-end -end encryption means that everything is encrypted uh, on the endpoints. There is no middle party that you know, exchanges data between each other which means if I send a message to Nick over here, it's encrypted on my device, and it gets delivered to Nick, and he's got the keys to decrypt it. <clears throat> what this means is, let's say Nick and I are in a room having a private one-on-one -on -one chat uh, physically. Uh, we are sure that there's no one around us. Nobody can hear us. We are trying to replicate the same behavior into a messaging product. So you know, uh, it's just between Nick and me no one can um, understand it because you know, no one has the keys to understand it. They don't have access to those conversations. And when I say no one has access to those conversations, this is important because even us, uh, AWS as a service provider, we do not have access to the data that our customers create as well. Uh, if you look at traditional um, you know, communication products that are not into an encrypted, typically data is stored in a cloud that's hosted somewhere, and that's usually hosted by the service provider. Uh, in our world, there is no data that's hosted in the cloud. It's just directly delivered to the endpoint. So even if we want to, AWS cannot access the content, which gives customers complete control over the data. And because there's no middle party, it significantly reduces the risk for adversary in the middle attacks. Uh, you know, we, we all know that once the world moved to a hybrid cloud and hybrid, hybrid collaboration environment, you could see a lot of people trying to hack the communications and all that stuff, which is why end-to-end -end encryption has picked up a lot in the last, last year or so. This is all great, but what good is security if it can't be used? You know, it's, it's gotta be a good seamless experience. Like, I wanna just show you how our collaboration experience works. This is desktop, obviously. You can see rooms, you can see direct messages, and this is a room, and you can go to the room details, and you can add more members, uh, you can see who's in the room. You can make more people as moderators. What's important to note here is it's a very, it's a simple experience that puts people um, in, the, in, in the center. It's a people first experience that we have built. Everything is around the people. We do have um, you know, pretty advanced security features. Uh, if you notice, uh, you will see, um, so, you know, once I go to edit, you will see expiration timers and burn on read. So that is, we have ephemeral messages. So what this means is you can configure uh, in a particular room when you're having sensitive conversations that you want the conversation to expire after five days, seven days. And your organization can set this policy too, but you as an end user, depending on context, can set a policy for that particular room as well. And you also have burn on read, which means that if a message is delivered, and if somebody reads the message, you can determine when that message has to be delegated so that you know it's safe and secure. And this is the profile. Obviously, you know you can have a good profile photo so that it's relatable. We have at mentions. Uh, we've got you know all the bells and whistles that come with uh, a, a regular communication app. Now let's talk about data retention, and this is something that we have spent a lot of time 
understanding what the customers would want, and we have actually took a very unique approach to building this. But before that, I want to address the elephant in the room, which is, wait, I thought everything is encrypted. Like, what do you mean by organizations can retain data? This is a conversation between me and Nick. How can my organization know what's going on, right? Uh, yes, conversations are still end-to-end -end encrypted and can only be accessed on validated endpoints. We do not compromise on that security posture. Um, however, like I said, organizations have a need to retain data. And what we have done is we have actually built, uh, I'll explain this um, in, in this flow, when Anna sends a message to John, like I mentioned, it's encrypted on Anna's device and it gets decrypted on John's device. Now, this is what happens with Wicker by default. Uh, when organizations go and enable a feature, what we call data retention, we give organizations the ability to host a retention bot within their network. And when I say bot, um, I want to be extremely clear, bot is another user in their network. It's just a ghost user in the sense that, but it's not deployed within an AWS environment. It's actually deployed within the customer's environment. And because the customer owns the bot, like as a service provider, we do not know what's going on within the bot. We provide the technology to the customer to run the bot, to update the bot. But the actual endpoint itself is owned by the customer, just like how uh, another end user in the organization is also, you know, belong, belongs to that particular customer. So now when retention is enabled, when a conversation happens between Anna and John, the bot receives that conversation too. Um, think of the bot as a stenographer in the room that kind of you know, types what's going on. But, but the key thing is the stenographer has to be present in the room. In this case, the bot has to be present in the network. The bot is encrypted. So the bot has the right symmetric keys to kind of decrypt the conversation. And if anything happens with the bot with respect to the wrong keys or anything like that, we notify the administrators and we stop retaining information too so that the data is always protected. And customers also can configure a data store of their choice. You know, obviously, uh, out of the box, we have S3 and KMS integrations, so you can easily configure an S3 bucket. And this is important because we understand that customers have very unique data residency needs. Uh, what I mean by that is, you know, some of our customers have their teams working out of US, working out of Europe, working out of Asia, and they have come to us with requirements saying, I want my US conversations to not leave the US boundary. I want my European employee conversations to not leave the European boundary. So what customers can do, what we have enabled customers to do, is to set up S3 buckets or any data store of their choice in their local regions and route data to that particular region so that you know, when data is at rest, it's within the boundary that they want it to be. And the most important thing being both the bot and the data server is completely within the customer's control. Uh, they can self-host it, they can put that in AWS, uh, it's completely the customer's choice. And because they own this, I'm emphasizing again that we do not have access to that conversation. Um, let's look at a demo of how simple it is to actually set up this. I mean, this all sounds great, um, but we wanna make sure that we build an experience that's easy for customers to set this up. So on the left, I've got AWS console. So I'm gonna access Wicker. On the right, I have got the desktop app, which end users will use. And down below um, is a command uh, center where I can install a Docker container. At the end of the retention bot, is nothing but a Docker container that, that contains a bot. So I'm gonna go to the admin console. I'm gonna hit data retention, and I'm gonna you know, copy the container. The container has, the bot has a key, and you, know, you get to copy the key. And if you can pay attention to the command line, you'll be seeing, once we activate the container, the green check mark happens in the console, and once I enable retention, you'll see the green, in the admin console, it turns active, and once it turns active, all the checks are done, and immediately, the server sends a notification to the client, indicating their organization's settings have changed. So from that moment on, end users are informed that their organization have enabled data retention, and it's something that you know, we want end users to be aware of. And now, I'm gonna just send a couple of messages. 
and you will see in the command line the keys getting rotated for every single message and uh, see how the encryption kind of goes through seamlessly uh, for every message. I'm just really slow at typing, sorry. That's just me, me typing that. Now, the message just sent, you saw the keys getting rotated. Now I'm gonna go, I'm obviously configured an S3 bucket to retain this data. So now I go to my S3 bucket, um, I've got multiple, now I get into the ones that I want to retain information, both the messages are there. And you can, customers can choose to have a bucket spun up in US East, London, any region of your choice. Customers can also choose to encrypt data at rest using KMS. Uh, you know, using an encrypted S3 bucket, technically. So this is all the coolness that we have built. I mean, it, the, the key approach that we have taken is that being an end-to-end -end encrypted product, we wanted to make sure that customers have the advanced security that they need while ensuring that they have complete control over the data. So that, you know, even if we get um, a request to, you know, get some customer data and submit it for legal reasons, uh, we have had some requests in the past. We, we just cannot because, you know, we don't have access to the data. So we, you know, send them to the customer, send, a, send whoever is requesting the data to the customer to work with them directly. So with this, um, I'm going to hand the mic over to Nick to talk about, you know, what Uncommon does. Over to you, Nick. Thanks, Arvin. So I, I get the awesome opportunity to not necessarily get super technical with you today, but to talk a little bit about a really great story about uh, one of the biggest companies in the world, AWS, Amazon, coming together with one of the smallest companies in the world, Uncommon of St. Louis, Missouri, to work with a nonprofit to help them do some big things. And it starts with my company, Uncommon, uh, we've been around for about 12 years. We've been an uh, AWS partner for about six. Uh, we've fully embraced the cloud. Uh, we, we love working with Amazon. We love working with all these, all sorts of different customers. And we've been fortunate enough to have a lot of work with the Department of Defense. And we've learned a lot about the missions and supported wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. And, and uh, a big part of who we are is we're, we're a veteran, you know, we have a lot of retired veterans. We have 25% of our force is, is retired military veterans, but we combine those folks with, with great young talent and people that are passionate about, you know, coming up with solutions. And those solutions typically evolve around secure cloud, cyber operations, and trusted data solutions. And as one of the owner operators of the company, I have this awesome privilege to decide how we spend our money. And sometimes I get to spend our money on charitable endeavors. And that's where this kind of comes together. And so, um, as you may or may not be aware of, the United States was at war uh, with their NATO allies in Afghanistan for roughly the last 20 years. Um, it was an incredible uh, situation that required a lot of cooperation by local nationals in order for us to help um, you know, root out terrorism as well as rebuild the country after a war. Uh, 20 years is a very, very long time. That's a generation, right? Um, there were kids born after the United States and its allies landed in Afghanistan that never really understood what uh, the previous regime was like. And so after 20 years, the United States decided in uh, summer of last year that it was time to go. It was time to allow the Afghan people to um, kind of get back into the way that they want to run their country. And as a result of that, uh, obviously different political opinions and things like that, I won't get into it, but there was a significant amount of people that had spent a lot of time supporting the U.S. and its NATO allies. And as a result of that, they were in danger. And so in August of last year, um, the United States military and government spent 31 days evacuating as many assets, peop people, and local nationals out of Afghanistan as possible. It was 
chaos, absolute chaos. And it just, that's just the, the nature of the beast when you're in a situation like this. Um, and as a result of that chaos, a lot of Afghan, what I would say allies, were left behind. And those allies number, in some estimates, as high as 100,000 people. And so, you know, essentially, the United States is out of the country on September 1st. The Taliban take over. And potentially 100,000 people now are at risk for the support they provided to the U.S. and its allies. Uh, that's a huge hole to fill. That's a huge uh, opportunity for, for someone to slide into to try to provide support. And so one of those organizations that slid into support is, a, is an operation called Operation Recovery out of Florida. Um, John Collette uh, had been working for a number of years in support of different military charities and decided this was something that he couldn't um, live with. And he had a lot of connections and friends that were able to help him stand up a ground operation to actually help evacuate Afghan nationals out of country. Um, as you can imagine, this is not an easy thing. And so there's a lot of parts and pieces to this, and I can't get into every single be, uh, piece of it, but what I can say is we had to stand up, they had to stand up a case management system. They have uh, operatives on the ground in Afghanistan that are uh, actively working with families and, and different people that supported the, uh, the US and its allies over those 20 years, identifying them for potential evacuation, trying to work with Operation Recovery back in Florida to arrange for visas and uh, private charters out of the airports, um, potentially ground transportation out of country. Um, so there's just a lot of logistics here. And then you have a very, very big uh, time difference. And so we have volunteers in the United States trying to coordinate all this through the State Department and through all different organizations. So there's a lot of moving pieces here. And as a result of the chaos and trying to stand this up as fast as possible, um, there were some things that were missed. And as you can see here, what, we, what they st stood up was they actually stood up a network of what they call shepherds in Afghanistan. Um, those shepherds would identify uh, opportunities and send that information via email, text message, or other communications back to the United States. A case would be opened in, uh, in a case management system. And then coordination would occur. And that coordination required information being shared back and forth between Afghanistan and the United States. A lot of times that was personal identifiable information. That was pictures. That was information required to gain people visas. And so it was very critical information, information that identified where they lived in Afghanistan, information that identified who they were. And as you can imagine, you don't want that stuff getting out. You don't want the Taliban to find out that you're trying to leave the country. Well, unfortunately, as a result of, like I said, a misstep, uh, all of this communication was going back and forth unencrypted. And as the Taliban gained more and more control over the country, September, October, November, uh, you started seeing the Taliban intercepting emails. You started seeing them uh, get on devices uh, at checkpoints and, and figuring out who these people were, getting access to information that we didn't want them to have access to. And this was a huge, huge issue for Operation Recovery. It put a lot of lives in danger, not just the family members, but the operatives on the ground, the shepherds, that were working very, very hard, tirelessly, uh, night and day, to make this happen, their lives were at risk. Um, and in some cases, unfortunately, uh, there were several instances of folks being hunted and pursued by the Taliban. So I had the great opportunity presented to me in September of 21 by, by Wicker, to, and they came to me and we, we had a good conversation. They said, look, you're a great Amazon partner. We have this amazing new um, service that we're, we purchased in the summer of 21, and it does great, uh, very easy to implement end-to-end -end communication encryption, and we have a potential opportunity working with Operation Recovery. Are you interested? Are you, can you help? They need help. This is an immediate need. Is there anything you can do? Uh, and 
as I mentioned earlier, this really falls into what we at Uncommon do. This is, falls right into our value system. Um, we love to give back, we love to contribute. Uh, it just so happened that this ties together with like a military mission that we had been working on. And so we were more than happy to jump in with both feet to try to figure this out. Had I ever seen Wicker? No. Did I know how hard it was gonna be to implement? Not at all. But did I have a great partner and a great team at the Wicker side of the house that said that they would do whatever it takes to train us and get us in a position to make this a reality? Yes. And so I was all in. You know, so we had a challenge in front of us. We had to find a way of encrypting all of the traffic between the shepherds in Afghanistan and the U.S. operations of the nonprofit. We needed to make sure we protected these folks and their information. Um, we needed to do this very, very quickly. As I mentioned, people were being hunted at the time that I was engaged. And so this was, the timing was at the utmost importance, right? But you have to do it right. You can't sacrifice corners. You have to make sure that when you put a solution in place and you tell people that you're protecting their information, you wanna make sure you're doing it right and you do it right the first time. So as I mentioned, Wicker was our solution. And Wicker made no doubt about it that they were gonna go in hand in hand with us and work very hard to get us up to speed. Um, why, why does Wicker make sense? I mean, Arvid just kind of walked you through, did a lot of my work for me, telling you why Wicker is an amazing product. It's very easy to use. And so we were very excited about the possibility of, of putting this in place. Um, we needed to encrypt and migrate all that uh, case management system traffic. And so they actually had a case management system called Apricot. And we had to um, basically ensure that burner phones and other things could quickly bring, be brought up to speed on the Wicker network. So there's Wicker mobile apps that are incredibly easy to install. Um, you can run it through VPNs or not, but we were able to you know, identify that we could get these apps on the mobile phones, the burners and things like that within minutes. And so that was critical. You know, we had to have a solution we could stand up very quickly and that was accessible to the people in Afghanistan. Um, and so this was a tremendous opportunity and we, t we jumped in with both feet. And what ended up happening was, you know, we took that original situation, right? You have a shepherd on the ground, they're identifying folks to move, they're working to get them visas, they're working through all, this, uh, all these steps to get them out of country. And so we basically said, you know what? There is a way for us to tie in with Wicker's APIs and we stood up a Wicker server inside of AWS and we were able to actually plug in Wicker email addresses that are given to you when you stand up a Wicker app uh, login and use that to kind of hijack the notification systems inside of the case management system. This allowed us to plug in immediately and so as communications moved back and forth, we shuffled, we moved all those communications over to the Wicker network. What did this do? Well, this made sure that all those communications were encrypted. And by, by pushing all of the Afghan shepherds over to the Wicker mobile app, we were able then to guarantee that when they sent communications from their mobile application, it traveled across an encrypted channel back to the operation recovery operators in Florida. There's a few steps that go into this. Obviously, you know, we, we had to use some lambdas to make this happen. Uh, it's very straightforward. Wicker has a lot of templates that we're, we were able to grab, pull over and use and implement. And so like I said, it's, it's, it was a very straightforward solution that ended up making sure that it didn't matter if it was a mobile device, didn't matter if it was a desktop, we were able to encrypt all of those communications back and forth to and from Afghanistan. So what did that really mean at the end of the day? Um, so obviously we encrypted the traffic and we were very happy about that, but we also identified another issue and that was the time difference issue. The time difference was creating problems for operatives on the ground who needed information right away so they could make a decision on the people that they were supporting. And in some cases, because this is a volunteer nonprofit organization, they did their best to staff it as well as they could overnight. But in some cases, you would see hours go by before an operative 
a shepherd could actually get information they needed to do their job. And so what we were able to do is say, you know what, not only have we been able to encrypt all the traffic, but Wicker provides this opportunity to use bots, Wicker bots. And you can inject those into the chat stream and evaluate specific questions. And so we worked with the volunteer group to identify the types of questions that were coming in from the ground. And we created Wicker bots that actually were allowing them to submit a question such as, you know, what is the status of a visa for a specific individual or family? And that bot would actually go into the case management system, pull that data out, and send it back in almost instantaneously, right? It was just really the cost of how long it took that Lambda to evaluate the situation and send that data back over the encrypted channels. So what does that do? Well, that means you've moved things that took maybe four hours, six hours, eight hours, and you made it into something that gets them a return response under a minute. I mean, you can imagine the impact that has on the operations for this organization when you're providing that data back to these shepherds as, as, as fast as you can. And so this was a tremendous impact on top of what we had already done, which was encrypt all the traffic to prevent Taliban interception. So this was a great, you know, all around kind of solution that was put together. Uh, and it all came together because of the collaboration across the teams. And you're probably sitting there going, well, Nick, this probably took you a year to implement. I mean, that's probably why you're standing in front of me in November. You took a year to do it, you know? I mean, how many people's lives were lost while you were doing that? Well, here's the best part about it. We did all of that in three months, right? Stood up an entire environment, stood up our Wicker server, stood up and migrated all the data, got the users in Afghanistan on the mobile applications, got their logins tied into the case management system, built Wicker bots to respond to specific operational questions, you know, reducing uh, response times by upwards of 50% all in three months. It's quite an achievement. Very, very proud of our team at Uncommon. Very, very proud of the team of Wicker, Arvin's teams, and uh, what we are able to do for operation recovery. Uh, which is something that we have to do. We had to do it. Uh, it's, it's, it's our duty to help these people. I'll throw out a couple of things before I hand it back to Arvid. You know, I have a, a screenshot here, operationrecovery.org. This is an ongoing mission. There's still roughly 90,000 people that need evacuation from Afghanistan. The sad part about this is is Afghanistan has not been given uh, or declared a humanitarian situation by the UN, and so the folks in Afghanistan are not officially refugees. What this means is they don't get funding, they don't get support from the UN like you would in other areas such as Ukraine today, which obviously Ukraine is a terrible disaster as well, and there's a ton of outpouring of support and funding that is available for Ukrainian refugees that is not necessarily available for the Afghan people. And so what I would like to encourage you to do is if you, if you want to make a donation, I know John and his team would very much appreciate it. Their mission is ongoing, and, and as you can see, they've already evacuated over 3,500 people through private charters or private ground transportation. You know, this is not an easy task that they're doing, and, and it's God's work, and we uh, appreciate everything they're doing and would appreciate you guys helping support the mission. So I'll hand it back to Arvid now. Thanks, Nick. Um, I think this is probably the tenth time I've heard the story. I mean, we've obviously been working closely, but it just fascinates me every single time. Like, thank you for, you know, making the world a better place to live. Uh, we actually work with a lot of NGOs um, that's dealing with humanitarian issues in many places. Uh, and I should say that, you know, one of the team, things that our team is very excited about is to have built a product that, you know, helps save people's lives at the end of the day. Um, and the feeling is incredible when we hear stories like this. So thank you, Nick. Um, Nick walked us through how Uncommon helped uh, you know, Operation Recovery in you know, aiding Afghan refugees. Uh, one of the things that he touched upon was how Uncommon automated some workflows using bots. So I wanted to kind of take that thread and explain how any organization can do workflow automation within Wicker. So we have what we call Wicker bots. Um, 
you know, we have an SDK, it, it allows developers to easily build, you know, custom purpose chatbots. Uh, the great thing about this SDK is that, you know, like I mentioned before, we spoke about a data retention bot. Uh, this is, uh, this, you can create a bot like data retention bot that serves any purpose that, that you would need. And the key thing about this is that all bots, including the data retention bot, is, is encrypted at the end of the day. So what this means is you're able to bring in data from a system of record uh, within Wicker, and you are able to allow people to make decisions and actions, uh, encrypted decisions and encrypted actions within Wicker, and you can take the data back to the system of record and update. In Uncommon's example, they were able to customize responses and directly take data from the case management system to provide responses and take, take the data back to the case management system based on what users kind of update in terms of what their status is. So that's what Wicker Bots does. And you know, uh, bots can also be self-hosted. Um, like Nick spoke about how they kind of integrated with Lambda. Uh, imagine if you're in an environment where you would need the bot to be self-hosted as well, because you know you need maximum security for the bot as well. Uh, we we do prefer that option, and we also understand that uh, we want to empower many as many teams as possible to build bots, because in a big organization you're going to have multiple use cases that needs automation. You need to empower your team to actually go build bots and workflow automate the workflows. So we have created um, a specific admins for bots. Uh, who will just have the ability to manage the bots that they create and not have access to other administrative controls. That way you can ensure that your organization's uh, super admins have full control over the network and you have bot admins that can, you know, you can compartmentalize bot development that will help all of your organization to efficiently, um, you know, automate workflows. Now let's take a look at how bots actually work. This is a broadcast bot. Um, so this is used by a lot of our company, a lot of our customers to broadcast messages and get responses, right? So this is obviously our iOS canvas, and uh, this video shows the manifestation of a broadcast, broadcast boss for an end user. And as you can see, we have slash commands. You hit start, the bot kind of you know, kicks off a particular workflow, and now it's asking me, how do you want to send this broadcast message? Uh, you know, is it based on a security group, or you know, you want to pick users? And you can also see the small bubbles that show up. Um, I, it will show up in a minute again. So I'm just going to send a broadcast message. So the bot understands that I have already picked a list of people, and I want to know their location. And you can see yes, no, cancel. Those are pre-configured responses for every single workflow. And you can configure them. Like, as you can see, now it's confirm and cancel based on the action that the user has taken. So I confirm. And you know, because it's going to go, we are asking for double confirmation. Uh, customers can configure double acknowledgment, triple acknowledgment, however they want. So now I want to hit status. And obviously, it's sent to 134 users. Um, you know, the total users are 134, it's reached 131, and you can, you can also see the list of people by just hitting a slash map command. And it'll give you uh, a manifestation of the location of all those people. And you can configure it to, you know, hit a Google API and build a map that will show, you know, all of it. So, like, the possibilities are endless in the sense that you're able to bring in data from wherever you want. You're able to pre-configure responses based on your workflows, and you're able to kind of take data to wherever you want. And all the responses are captured um, and recorded. You are able to use those responses to build dashboards or map views or however you want. So I um, mean, this is just a simple manifestation. We have customers that use these workflows um, in missions on the field where time is of essence, where you cannot wait for someone to you know, call someone and get help. Uh, they have immediate instructions, restrict, um, immediate uh, kind of SOPs in place that will help them evac with the evacuation machines, uh, with, 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 the, with many other workflows. So that's Wicker Bots. Um, we also recently announced Wicker ATAC plugin. Again, in our journey to kind of ensure that you know, we are one of the most secure uh, you know, collaboration tools in the market, we understood that a lot of our customers uh, especially public sector customers, uh, use 
a product called TAC and for missions. So let me just explain what this means. So TAC is Team Awareness Kit. Uh, ATAC is Android Team Awareness Kit. So you've got a lot of, uh, you know, um, firefighters, emergency responders, uh, people who are deployed on mission um, use TAC. So what's the benefit of TAC? TAC, it's, it's a map-based solution. So when you're on the field, um, you don't want to be distracted with uh, a lot of different things, and you work pretty closely with your crew to get missions accomplished. And the most important thing there is to know where your team is. Like you, you should know where your team is, you should be able to reach them easily, you should be able to get to where they are. So like the location becomes the centerpiece of your mission, and TAC enables uh, you know, location-based missions to be very efficient. Uh, so what did we do? So a lot of customers kind of came back and said, TAC is fantastic. Uh, we are able to uh, message each other with respect to our missions, but the messaging is text message at the end of the day. It's unencrypted. So people snooping traffic will be able to find out uh, who you are, where you are, what kind of message you're sending, which might compromise the mission. So what we did was we integrated um, Wicker with TAC. So within the TAC environment, especially on an Android device, when you're on mission, you are able to use Wicker to communicate with your, with your crew uh, in an encrypted way, not just messaging, but you're also able to call them, uh, not over a telephonic call, because as you know, telephonic networks can also be spoofed, especially when you're working in environments which are very sensitive, like you know, Afghanistan, for example. Uh, you know that you know, uh, certain governments will have the ability to monitor traffic over telephonic networks. So Wicker provides the security that this mission needs to be more effective. Now let's take a look at how this works. So this is how, this is attack view. As you can see, all the pink pins are actually people that you work with, and you're on a mission. And the flywheel is, is, is what all the TAC users use for different actions. And on the top middle of the flywheel, there's a wicker icon. It's kind of very minuscule. Um, so that's the integration that we have built. So what you can do is you can easily pick a person in this view, and you can hit wicker, and you can have different options. In this case, I hit the messaging option. Now I'm directly able to send an encrypted message to my team member right from the Wicker interface. The most important thing is I'm still within the TAC interface. So I'm focused on my mission and the tasks that are at hand. And again, I can also hit another person and call them. Um, and this is something that they cannot do today. Uh, they would not be able to do before the uh, Wicker integration in the sense that they are able to actually encrypt in an encrypted way place a call talk to their team member saying, hey, where are you? Um, I want to get to you, or I need some help, and get the help required very efficiently. And it, the, a lot of customers expressed delight in this integration, primarily because it just not only increases the security posture, uh, it also enables their, uh, the people on the mission to be effectively able to communicate with features that were not possible before. Uh, every single messaging modality works in this particular way. You, want, you can leave a voice memo um, so that you know, people can, uh, if you're working with someone cross-border and you don't understand their language, you, know, you have a translator with you, imagine them not being able to type and share information with you so they can leave a voice memo in their local language and the translator can help you translate uh, all through the TAC environment. And imagine if you want to automate a workflow and you, you're able to automate workflows now and push that onto a TAC interface for missions that need efficient responses. So the possibilities are endless here. So this is one of the really cool things that the team worked on for the past six months or so, and we are extremely happy that you know, we bring this value to a lot of customers. Now, I also want to talk about one more advanced feature that we have built. So Nick mentioned that uh, you know, in Afghanistan, a lot of people snoop traffic, right? And we need encryption because you know, we want to make sure that it's secure. Um, even then, you have a lot, of, um, a lot of different situations where in sensitive missions, um, people monitor networks. For example, all the traffic passes through some domains. And if you know, we know for a fact that uh, certain consumer apps that are widely used for end-to-end -end communications, uh, governments can track and monitor the traffic. And you know it's easy to kind of know which product they use and what you know how the product kind of you know 
uh, takes the traffic through the internet pipe. So what we built was we built something called Wicker Open Access. So when you enable Wicker, Wicker Open Access, what that does is it allows your, employee, your users to actually obfuscate traffic. So we have a series of proxies around the world that will kind of you know, bounce the traffic. And it's very hard for someone to monitor how the traffic is being kind of you know, run, traffic is being taken through. So we also have flexible options to enable this. Um, if at an organization level, your administrators can enable this for every single employee in your network, or end users can pick and choose and say, uh, I'm right now on a sensitive mission. I want to enable this. So this, um, we have another session today evening, um, which talks about how another nonprofit, Freedom Shield Foundation, helps uh, fight against human trafficking. They use Wicker Open Access a lot in the sense that you know, like when they are in sensitive missions rescuing people against trafficking, um, you know for a fact that uh, their mission is compromised if people know how they're communicating. So they use open access to ensure that you know, nobody can monitor and spoof, spoof the traffic. And this provides flexibility in terms of how they want to execute their missions. So uh, recap, um, we are pretty much at the end. Uh, every conversation in Wicker is end-to-end -end encrypted. Uh, we have flexible controls to manage um, in organizations. And we have built a unique customer-controlled approach for data retention. And we've got a lot of advanced uh, you know, secure communication features, you know, burn on read, ephemeral messages, Wicker open access. And uh, with all of this, we make sure that you know, security doesn't compromise user experience. So we've built a very intuitive and simple to use messaging experience as well. And uh, if you want to try Wicker, sign up. Um, you can go to AWS and you know, search for Wicker, and we would love to hear more about how we can help you secure your collaboration. And if you have any kind of uh, features or ideas that we can build, we would love to partner with you as well. So thank you. Thank you, Nick. <laughs>